This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And on this week's show, we delve a little more into ancient mysteries. We're going to be talking with Carl Lehrberger about his new book, Secrets of Ancient America, Archaeoastronomy and the Legacy of the Phoenicians, Celts, and Other Forgotten Explorers. And are you with us there, Carl? I am, and good evening, Zariah, and greetings to Where Did the Road Go radio listeners. <laughs> and uh, this is your, your only book, right? Only book yet. Okay. So what? how did you get into all this stuff? Well, people can find a little more about how I got into it and uh, about the book at uh, my, my newhistoryofamerica.com website at www.newhistoryofamerica.com. But I've been an explorer most of my life and have spent time uh, uh, in South America and Central America uh, beginning very early. But it was uh, 1986 when I read Barry Fell's America B.C. that really excited me. And I was living in New England at that time. And uh, Dr. Fell, who is, uh, was a uh, 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 professor at uh, Harvard uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology, uh, became uh, an expert in uh, the old world peoples in America. And uh, by, by using uh, a skill that he developed in, in reading ancient inscriptions called epigraphy, he uh, uh, generated a tremendous amount of interest of, um, among people like myself, where he, I thought, demonstrated that uh, the Celts and many other old world peoples had made it to the New World long before Columbus. And after reading that book, uh, which was published in uh, 1976, so I'm uh, Johnny come lately, you could say, <laughs> I began to explore some of the sites that Dr. Fell described uh, in the book that uh, were to be found in New England, including uh, areas of uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, even, even New York, your state. Mm -hmm. And uh, that got me into it and set out a 25-year a quest that resulted in uh, writing and publishing Secrets of Ancient America. And how long did it take you to write, to write this book? Oh, I have about 20 to 25 years of field research in it, but it took me three to four years to, uh, to pen. I found so many amazing things that my head was about to pop, <laughs> and I, th I thought I just had to get it out. Uh, some of the uh, uh, evidence that I did find of old world travelers in the New World and each chapter really documents one researcher that I focused on, and in most cases I, I, I knew the researchers and spent time with them and did my very best to learn what they had to teach and to write up uh, their research as part of a, 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 a collective body of work that, that describes much of the uh, diffusionist versus isolationist debate that we still have today that's kept us from knowing what our history is in America. And that's amazing to me that the, the fact that there is such a wealth of evidence and it doesn't we don't need two tons of evidence to prove that that people from the other side of the world were in this country before Columbus and but we have it and it's still ignored. It's it's really shocking and you know I think that many Americans especially those that listen to shows you know like yours Soraya you know, are, are aware that we've been lied to about our history. But what I found in the book that is that there is really a significant body of work and evidence that there were many old world peoples that visited America long before Columbus, including the Celts, including the Romans, including the Hebrews, and including people from, from India 
and Indus Valley civilization. And what became obvious in, in studying the work of others and mentors is that the serious claims of old world contact have been ignored by the archaeological community. And in, at the conclusion of the book, I, I write that we've been lied to about our history and that the historical record has been completely expunged. And what makes it worse is those who challenge the status quo uh, have been discredited. People like Barry Fell and uh, uh, anthropologist Gunnar Thompson, who wrote uh, America Discovery, uh, have presented really uh, significant evidence in, uh, that old world peoples were here, but have never been recognized uh, by the archaeological or the academic community. And, and why is that? Why are they so against recognizing any kind of pre-Columbus contact? Boy, that's a good question, and, it's, and, and, and you know, I think that, that the first is that the, the, the whole story of Columbus is, is a, a real mythology, and it, it, it supports a, a vision of America that is, that is white, Whites discovered America and that uh, uh, brought civilization, you know, to the New World. But when one looks at the historical record, there was a civilization here of the Native Americans, and that what the whites bought was was uh, genocide and slavery. And I think that Columbus was the vanguard of that. And uh, uh, the, the the mythology of American exceptionalism is somewhat rooted in in the, the mythology of Columbus. So those who dare to suggest that Columbus was last, not first, in discovering America really uh, have to be discredited or the whole uh, uh, a story of, of white supremacy and American exceptionalism uh, supporting the, Ameri uh, the American genocide uh, uh, be becomes to uh, unravel. And I think that, that those in academia that have rested their careers on a lie, uh, the last thing they want to do is admit that they were wrong. And I think that that is in part uh, the reason why we, we have a continuation of a, of a lie of who discovered America. And uh, one of the myths that, that you, you talk about in this book is that uh, at the time, most people did not believe the world was, fat, was flat. That's correct, and and uh, you know the 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 knowledge that the world the world was round really goes back you know to the Greeks, uh, the Chinese uh, drew uh, uh, around maps, and and it's just a, a really small part of history, American history, that the that they claim the world was flat, uh, you know, to to put one uh, religious group up ahead of another. But, but what, what the book pointed out to me in the research that, that I uncovered is that at, at, at the time of Columbus, you know, there were uh, a, a history here of America that far exceeded the civilization that Columbus brought to the Americas. Uh, that includes not only uh, in the sciences, such as uh, astronomy and uh, uh, astrology, but, but also in navigation and in, in, and in uh, uh, mineralogy. So there was a, a tremendous uh, uh, emergence of, of, of Europe out of the Dark Ages, but meanwhile, the, the rest of the, the, the world, including uh, India and, and the New World, you know, had advanced civilizations uh, in, in many ways superior to, to the European culture. What Europe did bring after, you know, years of, of conquest and war in, in, in the Old World uh, uh, is a, uh, a, a tyrannical uh, 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 ability to muster uh, technology for war and for conquering. And they, uh, one of the conclusions of, of the early part of the book is that Columbus uh, knew precisely where he was going based on earlier maps from the Arabs and uh, uh, from the Vikings, and that it was a mission to seek out riches and gold. And that's uh, part of the lie that, that has been disguised, and, and, I, and I write about that. And those that, that, that really hold the, the white vision of America that, that the, uh, as opposed to a multicultural society of America, you know, are, are going to continue to, to challenge this new history of America and instead want to hang on to the old history 
that uh, believes that Columbus did discover America and that the, the uh, Americas were inhabited by, by savages instead of having a continuity of civilizations over here uh, that, that had incredible architecture, art, uh, culture, and science. Now, we all know the official story of how Columbus uh, discovered America, but it, from what you've written, it sounds like things were okay the first time he came over. It wasn't an immediate genocide. Um, but when he came back, can, can you get into a little of what happened? Well, it's, it's a very dark and, 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 and sad period uh, uh, for the, uh, America and, 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 the, and the Native Americans. Uh, as I said, it was really a mission to seek out gold and riches. And, and when he did find uh, in, 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 in the Caribbean, uh, natives wearing little bits of gold that they had been able to, to collect, uh, he essentially enslaved them, uh, uh, the, 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 the Caribs, and, uh, in, and, and demanded that each, each uh, uh, adult deliver a, a thimble of gold a week. And if they weren't uh, able to, to provide the gold, they were, they were to lose their hands. And uh, 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 the most horrible crimes is described by, by the, the, the Spanish uh, 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 writers themselves uh, that, that transpired. And of course, part of the genocide was a physical genocide. But, but as we all know, with the uh, European uh, germs and, and viruses, uh, uh, after uh, Columbus had 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 uh, been in in the uh, Caribbean for for twenty to twenty five years, after twenty five years, uh, the, the civilization had had been pretty much wiped out by disease. So Columbus was really the first of of a, a, a line of of uh, uh, European conquerors and conquistadors, uh, followed by Cortez and Pizarro that 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 really claimed 90% uh, of, of uh, Native Americans um, within 50 years. Now, how come the diseases didn't come with earlier explorers? Why did, it, why did they come with these Europeans? Was it just that they were more apt to have these diseases than some of the earlier visitors? Well, that's a good question, and I, I'll be honest and, and say that, that we don't know uh, I, I think one one thing we can say is that the the levels of uh, 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 settlers were were not quite as great, although the Celts did achieve uh, uh, a significant uh, landing uh, in in New England, and they made their way through the river systems all the way into Colorado and Oklahoma. I think that it was it was a issue of of, of numbers. Uh, and the fact is, we just don't know uh, what results the contact uh, in, in those days had. But it's a good question and, and a, another reason for really studying a new history of America. If, if, if the archaeologists and the anthropologists don't believe that, that uh, Romans, uh, Celts, uh, Mediterranean peoples were here, how could we even possibly ask that question? So it's, it's a great jumping off point to ask you know the question: Why why aren't the academics, the archaeo priesthood, uh, uh, looking at questions like this, and not only questions of of disease, but what happened to some of these explorers that that made it over here? Yeah, and you say in the book that it's likely that they either died or were assimilated into the native uh, cultures, or uh, you, or returned, you know, with their gold and silver and, and whatever else they came over here for. Mm -hmm. So, especially uh, with uh, civilizations coming over the Pacific, like from India, uh, we, we had a, a constant contacts that went on for hundreds of years at a time. And we had very well organized mining expeditions and uh, uh, navigations inland into Nevada and, 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 and California. And these very well organized mining expeditions were regular occurrences, probably uh, uh, based on uh, astro astronomical and astrological cycles, as well as seasonal cycles so that they could uh, 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 use the currents and the, and the trade winds. So there was uh, 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 not only did, did, do we see warfare between the natives and some of the new colonists uh, as, as described uh, it, 
in a uh, series of lead crosses that have been found near uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona, describing a, a colony called Calalus. Uh, that that existed in Arizona from about 600 under to 900 AD and the chronicler of that uh, community describes how at the end the the Native Americans or the Toltecs as they were described on these lead crosses pretty much wiped out the community of Calalus and there are other uh, references uh, uh, including in the book by Jean Matlock uh, India once ruled America of how often harsh the conditions were for these colonists. Uh, there's other uh, uh, evidence that uh, many of these uh, groups were integrated into Native Americans, or if not the, the actual groups themselves, as uh, demonstrated through DNA of some uh, Native groups, including some of the Cherokee tribes. We do find in, in some Native American groups uh, words from uh, old world languages that, that, that are still in use today, and also many, many of the stories that, that uh, Native Americans uh, of specific tribes tell. It's, it's, a good, it's a good point in the conversation to, to say that the 99.9% uh, uh, .9 of the petroglyphs in uh, North America are from Native Americans or from the ancestors of, of the Native Americans. And in the, in the book, uh, uh, Secrets of Ancient America, uh, I rely very heavily on, on about uh, 15 or 16 sites, petroglyph sites, that are not Native American sites, that, that they have inscriptions or writing from uh, uh, the Celts in particular, but uh, we also find a Roman writing and Phoenician writing in the Americas. But the point is that this, this evidence of old world travelers, uh, especially the inscriptions, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not, I, I don't want to leave the impression with uh, the audience that, that, that some or, or most of the petroglyphs are old world. In fact, it's a very, very, very small group of uh, uh, several dozen uh, that really make the case that the old world peoples were here. But the point is that that is evidence. These writing in stones, some of them have uh, 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 dates uh, on it, including the Kensington root stone, uh, rune stone from Minnesota uh, that has a date as it, as it tells the story of these Icelanders coming to America. So when the archaeo priest and the archaeologists say there is no evidence uh, that uh, 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 old world peoples from both uh, uh, Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic were not here. It's it's simply a lie. There there is an abundance of evidence, and the best evidence that I found were these inscriptions written in stone uh, found throughout America. So, the argument comes down to the diffusionism, which is uh, um, as you know that these people could actually navigate the world, versus the isolationist argument that the Americas were completely separate from the rest of the world until Columbus got here. But um, uh, the diffusionism argument is, as you put it, it's almost religious in the way that they approach it. Like, it's just, you can't challenge it, you can't argue with it, they, they, they'll they blackball you, they'll do whatever they can, and you talk about the Smithsonian playing a part in this. Well, you know, it's... I, I set out to write a book because uh, many of my mentors, including Barry Fell, Bill McGlone, Phil Leonard, Gunnar Thompson, Warren Dexter, Ider Jane Gallagher, Gene Matlock, Carl Johansson, many, many diffusionist scholars have written about certain aspects of diffusionism. Uh, that is that culture comes from the outside as opposed to independent learning. Uh, as uh, uh, many of the isolationists in academia believe. And perhaps with the exception of David H. Kelly from the University of Calgary, most diffusionists aren't uh, archaeologists. And in the case of, of, of Kelly, uh, he, was, he was tolerated by the academic community because he was an academic himself and was a very famous Mayanist uh, uh, who, who was instrumental in, in cracking some of the Mayan code. So the attitude about David Kelly was, oh, you know, that was just David Kelly going way off uh, in La La Land uh, about diffusionism. 
uh, but uh, you know we tolerate him because of, of he's an academic. So there, there is just a tremendous history of, of, of dozens and dozens of diffusionist writers, but, but none of us have broken through the paradigm. And you mentioned the Smithsonian, and let's also talk about National Geographic. In uh, five chapters of the book, I document uh, in great detail the uh, exploits and the travels of Celtic travelers uh, in New England, uh, in uh, West Virginia, and in Colorado, uh, as well as uh, sites in Oklahoma and Kansas. And uh, it's not just my research, but it's the research of, of many thorough uh, uh, researchers that have do documented this. And to this day, I've never seen a article or uh, anything to do with Celts in America in National Geographic or the Smithsonian. And uh, being up there in uh, New, New York where you are uh, is one of the, the really the most accessible sites that we have in America demonstrating the, uh, a Celtic president, presence in, in uh, America, and that is America's Stonehenge uh, in southern New Hampshire, right near the border with Massachusetts. And this is a massive site uh, that has uh, 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 stone structures, uh, that where where apparently they live, but most importantly, uh, the 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 site is an archaeoastronomical site where they were had uh, large monoliths to uh, cast shadows on the specific days of the year of the equinoxes and the cross quarter days. Those are those special days between equinox and uh, solstice that the ancient Celts marked. And one can go to uh, America Stonehenge and go to the center of the site and look out down below and see where these uh, ancient uh, uh, monolithic uh, stones were set up so that one could line up to the sun. So the, 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 it's, it's not like uh, uh, Scientific America or, or uh, National Geographic or the Smithsonian you know, would be uh, stepping out so far because there's such a, a significant body of published research and artifacts uh, documenting the Celts. And by artifacts, I mean stone inscriptions written in Celtic languages here in America, dozens of them. Uh, so none of us have broken through the, uh, the, the, the uh, paradigm, the archaeopriesthood dogma, that, that not only we find in the uh, major publications of the day, uh, uh, but most importantly, we, we find these archaeo priests as the gatekeepers to, to universities. And the experience that Gunnar Thompson, who wrote uh, uh, America Discovery, had is just a case in point where even though uh, Dr. Uh, Thompson was able to document dozens and dozens of symbols uh, from uh, India and, and, and to a lesser extent China, but from Asia in Mesoamerica. Uh, it, he was never able to, to get much uh, uh, credentials uh, or tenure, and he was, uh, he, he, they wouldn't even allow him to publish his dissertation because it did uh, document uh, this uh, diffusionist theme. So, you know, until we see some kind of openness on the part of the major publications of our day, like National Geographic and the Smithsonian. And until we get students and graduate students insisting that the old archaeo priest uh, uh, open up the curriculum to uh, look at some of these uh, fascinating uh, uh, evidence of old world travelers in the new world and the evidence that they left behind, uh, most Americans are going to remain in the dark. Now, it seems like the, the, these institutions will sort of accept that maybe the Vikings made it here. And uh, I, I, there was an article just recently published about uh, them finding a Norse village dating from the 9th or 10th century along the Hudson River. Are you familiar about with that? Uh, uh, the, most of the evidence of the, of, of, of the, you mean the upper Hudson River, and most of the evidence really is not so much in uh, uh, North America, but but in 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 places like like uh, uh, islands in between. However, uh, you're absolutely correct. They will the the archaeo priest and the archaeological community will acknowledge that perhaps Eric the Red 
and some of the Vikings were here. But uh, it continues to ignore the tremendous amount of, 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 of evidence that we, that, that, that we have. And, you know, some of that evidence of, of uh, colonies uh, in um, uh, the upper New York and, and, in, in, and in southern uh, Canada has, has been uncovered and written about by perhaps the most uh, famous uh, uh, diffusionist of his day, Thor Heyerdahl. Now, Thor Heyerdahl is a name many people are familiar with. He sailed the, the uh, Contiki and really proved that, that uh, you could make these large, uh, long voyages across the oceans to America. But as famous uh, and as charismatic as Thor Heyerdahl was, uh, his, his most important book on diffusionism, uh, which in English uh, uh, was translated to be No Borders, was never translated out of his native uh, Norwegian. And in, in his book, uh, uh, along with his uh, co-author, Par Lillestrøm, uh, Heiderdale went to the Vatican and he documented from the tax records that there was a, uh, a lively group of colonies uh, in Upper New York and in uh, uh, Canada. And it's documented because of the tax records. So he, he wrote the book. Uh, uh, it, it, which included some of this evidence from the from the Vatican, as well as other evidence that he and his uh, uh, geographer uh, uh, co-author wrote about. But the book No Borders was never translated out of Norwegian, and and very very few people have, have ever heard about it. So this this somewhat conspiracy against the diffusionist even even trapped uh, Thor Heyerdahl, as famous as as he was. And, and he kind of went to prove uh, what I first heard David Hatcher Childress say, that the oceans are highways, not obstacles. And that is, that is such a great point. And it's, 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 it's just incredible that, that we, we think of the, of the ancients as, as kind of primitives, when in fact uh, their, their, na their, their shipbuilding capabilities and their navigational skills Far, were far superior to the Spanish in, in you know, 1492. The ships uh, carried not dozens of people, but hundreds of people. They were, they were massive, and they were very well adorned. Ships coming from uh, uh, India to America were adorned with, with gold and sh silver and, and were really set for expeditions. So, so, so Childress puts it very well. They were, they were the highways and the byways of the ancient, uh, of the ancient world. And it, to this day, when, when I do talk about the book, the, the, the very first question that, that a, a astounded person might ask is, well, how could they have possibly got here? And it's just so far out of our modern thinking because of our uh, educational uh, or disinformation that we've received that, that we don't understand that for the, for the uh, peoples of India as well as the Phoenicians and the Celtic uh, they they had far superior mariner skills than the uh, Europeans in 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 uh, fourteen ninety two. It, it also I think has something to do with that sort of social evolution sort of view where whatever we have now is the most advanced we could possibly have, and since that's our culture in fourteen ninety two, that's the most advanced that could have existed because who could be more advanced than us? Well, throughout the book, and especially at the end, I refer uh, to the uh, Planet of the Ape movie because I found that to be such a great analogy to what I see going on with the Archaeo priesthood. And for those in our, our audience who, who remember the, the, uh, the original Planet of the Ape movie, it, it ends with uh, Zarias, who was the head of the Ape uh, School of Archaeology, Theology, uh, School of Scientists, Sciences, uh, destroying the evidence of a uh, human village uh, because the uh, uh, the, chimp the chimpanzee uh, uh, Cornelius, uh, the young archaeologist, had discovered that uh, uh, the ape culture had come from a, a, a previous uh, uh, society of humans. So this, as the movie ends, uh, this was village was burned. The evidence was burned, and I think that we can make a pretty good case that uh, much of the evidence of the old world peoples in America has been covered up, uh, in that kind of analogy. 
All right, so Barry Fell was, you know, one of the things that got you started onto this. You want to tell us a little bit about him and what he did? Well, Barry Fell, you know, uh, is, uh, nobody wants to be associated with Barry Fell because the truth of the matter is that even though he inspired many people and he really, uh, I think, started uh, a, a new history of a, uh, the study of a new history of America, uh, uh, beginning, uh, you know, in uh, 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 the, the later part of the, the 20th century, we have to acknowledge that Barry Fell made some pretty significant mistakes. He was a pioneer in that he, as a microbiologist, he learned epigraphy, which is the study of ancient writing systems, and set about a, a career of looking at inscriptions from all over the world, but particularly ancient inscriptions in America and doing his best uh, to interpret them. He, he, he founded uh, uh, a, a, a society that looked at epigraphy, uh, the Aesop uh, Epigraphy Society, uh, of occasional publications that uh, at its time was the most famous uh, dis diffusionist journal. And uh, he published three major books as well as literally hundreds of, of uh, journal articles. And in one sense, he was a pioneer in that he opened the, uh, the, the door for many of us researchers and documented a history of America that most people weren't aware of. On the other hand, his scientific methods uh, were lacking in many cases. He would take people's drawings of inscriptions or photographs and not having visited the sites uh, would often try to do an interpretations that other diffusionist scholars found to be incorrect. And so because of this, uh, he left himself very vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, critiques from the academic community. And I think what happened with Dr. Fell is that the academics, in spite of his great work and original research, threw the baby out with the bathwater because he did make some serious mistakes and because he did uh, uh, often not visit these sites and, and, and only show part of the, the drawings done by others, uh, he was discredited. So many of the uh, modern uh, diffusionists have to be very careful that we want to acknowledge that Barry Fell was really the pathfinder that got many of us interested in looking into a new history and that uh, Barry Fell documented many, many sites uh, that have proven to be correct in terms of his in interpretation, particularly with some of the Celtic writings. But we also have to acknowledge that Barry did make mistakes, and it has made it much more difficult for diffusionist uh, scholars to emerge, you know, from the background uh, because w w the ploy of the uh, archaeo priesthood and the academians is to label you as uh, uh, somebody who uh, 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 believes like Barry Fell, which has a very, uh, you know, negative name in, in academia. And if one were to go and take a look at, uh, you know, some of the uh, Wikipedia articles, for example, uh, they're very critical of Dr. Fell. And, and I would have to say, uh, in some cases, uh, rightly so. But having said that, uh, uh, Dr. Fell blazed a pathway that, that, that dozens and dozens of, of uh, authors and diffusionists have taken off and taken to the next level. Uh, and a great example of that is, is my mentors, uh, 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 Phil Leonard and uh, Bill McGlone, uh, worked with Barry Fell for years, but for this very reason of, of his scientific methods broke with him. But uh, uh, McGlone and Leonard uh, spent a career looking at the Celts in uh, some of the Celtic sites in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Kansas, and uh, uh, taking some of Barry Fell's uh, uh, interpretations of those inscriptions to the next level. Uh, and they discovered many more uh, inscriptions out here uh, in, in the West, as well as archaeoastronomy sites where you have light and shadow play on the equinox, for example, that uh, tell a story. Archae Astronomy is an, is is a, the a language of of the ancients that's that's hardly recognized by the ar archaeological community, but Leonard 
and Maglone studied archaeoastronomy and looking at the Celtic ins in in inscriptions, they were able to determine that these inscriptions in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Kansas were talking about uh, celestial days of the year, like the equinox. For example, one of the inscriptions that uh, 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 Maglone and Leonard in in interpreted with Fell's help uh, was that the sun strikes here on the day of Bell. This is a Celtic inscription found in a cave in, in, in uh, southern Colorado uh, that's accompanied by a light and shadow show uh, on the equinox where light streams into a, a, a narrow opening of a cave and strikes the inscription precisely where it says strikes here. That's where the sun strikes on the day of the equinox referred to in the inscription as the day of Bel, B-E-L, uh, the, the well-known God that we even, sun God that we even see documented in the, the Bible. So we here have uh, uh, two colleagues and students of Barry Fell that both acknowledge his great work, but also had severe reservations about his methods, uh, went off on their own and made incredible discoveries, but because they have a, an association with Barry Fell at some point, they were discredited and, and to this day, even though they, uh, their work remains the most significant documentation of uh, the Celtic presence in, in America, nobody has ever heard of the name Phil Leonard or uh, of Bill McGlone or read any of their books. Hopefully the, the attention that I gave them in uh, Secrets of Ancient America in three chapters will will help uh, 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 all of us uh, understand that a tremendous amount of research and knowledge exists documenting and proving that the Celts as well as other people were here if we can get the word out. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in one minute with Carl Lerberger. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and not necessarily those of WBBR or its management. Where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to wheredidtheroadgo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. And tonight we're talking with Carl Lehrberger about his book, Secrets of Ancient America. And this is a, this is a thick volume. This is almost 400 pages. It's a big book. Uh, you have a lot of pictures, and, and the information is just dense in this volume. It's not something you just flip through. You, you have packed so much solid information in here, and you keep it very, very grounded. You don't go off into idle speculations. You're looking for stuff you can actually nail down, and that is, that is a really refreshing take on this. Well, thank you, Zerai. I, I, I really appreciate that uh, because one of the most important things that I tried to do in the book is, is, is take the high road as far as presenting uh, evidence that could be documented. And uh, there's a, a lot of different roads to go down in, in, in the new history. And when, when, when push comes to shove, in many cases, uh, for example, uh, uh, giants in, in North America as well as aliens in rock art, uh, I was never able to come up with smoking guns. So I really stayed to the areas of archaeoastronomy, epigraphy, and the evidence that uh, has been documented, as well as some of the discoveries that I've made, to do my best to make a credible and convincing case that we've been lied to about our history, that Columbus did not discover America, and that we have an incredible a multicultural tradition here in America of uh, uh, travelers and, and, and groups coming both across the Atlantic 
and across the Pacific to America, uh, not only for, for gold and silver and riches in regular mining expeditions, but also to settle here. Uh, many, many of the ancients came here uh, escape, escaping uh, the, the politics and wars that, that took place throughout the world. Others perhaps were driven here uh, by uh, a climate and uh, 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 weather conditions uh, uh, and, and, and perhaps even comet disasters. So America, you know, as it is today, uh, was in those days uh, a, a refuge. The point of the book is really to expose that we've been lied to and that uh, to inspire others uh, to to look at the evidence and to take take it take the studies to the next level in the universities and and in the media and do our very best to reconstruct uh, uh, a new history of america and and the I do appreciate the fact that more and more areas are are that Columbus Day is coming under fire. You know, there, there's a movement to change it to uh, Native American or, you know, day or just a day to celebrate the Native peoples here rather than Columbus. And that's just a, a theme that's catching on in some cities and some states. And I think it will continue uh, uh, to, to catch on. You know, one of my inspirations in writing Secrets of Ancient America is the work of Gunnar Thompson, who I previously uh, uh, mentioned, uh, who wrote America Discovery, as well as uh, uh, several other books uh, documenting old world peoples in, in America. And Dr. Thompson makes a very convincing case and a very powerful case uh, that, that we have a very uh, a, a proud tradition here in America of a multicultural uh, uh, country. Uh, multicultural history. And, and as we peel away the layers of our history, that's going to be borne out. So it's not just the, the uh, Native Americans that, that we uh, have to celebrate and, and, and want to celebrate instead of the white conqueror uh, Columbus, but it's, it's also the, all the other uh, uh, groups that, that made it here and have been integrated into the American culture. So uh, I think I think w one reason why the archaeo priesthood and the academics have been so slow to respond to the evidence is that that if they take away the Columbus myth, you know, what's left? And I think it's that what's left piece that is so frightening to the status quo. And it, the problem, too, is not just from that side, but from the Native American side, too, at times, because uh, you, you tell a story how you asked one Native American what he thought of some of these ideas, and he was offended um, that you would suggest that they didn't develop this culture entirely, you know, in an isolated environment. It's a very, very <coughs> sensitive uh, uh, topic with, with, with many Native Americans. I, I uh, did document... Uh, in the very early part of the book, some of the esoteric traditions uh, and the archaeoastronomical traditions of Native Americans and the wisdom of the Native Americans. Uh, and I really do my very best to show that, that, uh, that uh, those, those traditions are, were very important. And without kind of putting any kind of spin on it, it's the Native American traditions stand on their own. However, in other instances, uh, for example, a site in, in California that I devote two chapters to, uh, making a, a connection with uh, Indus Valley culture, uh, at, a, at a particular site that the uh, nearby uh, uh, Native American Paiute tribe claims was their ancestors, it was uh, 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 very clear that, that not only were uh, the inscriptions and the petroglyphs not Native Americans, but that, that no one from the tribe had even been to the site in, in, in decades. And yet they became very offended with the, with the idea that uh, uh, it was not their people or their ancestors that created that site. So <clears throat> it's a very sensitive issue and really all of us have something new to learn uh, with the, the, the new history of America. But uh, I did my very best to both celebrate the wisdom of the Native Americans in the book, but point out that while we do have the uh, migration from Asia across the, the Bering Straits and the land bridge down uh, through the Americas, as has been documented, 
We also have other pathways uh, across the oceans from the east and across the oceans from the west. And those travelers that came from Europe, from the Mediterranean, and those travelers that came from Asia and from Indus Valley had an impact on the, some of the ancestors to the Native Americans. I do my very best in the book not to talk about Native Americans as a whole, but to be very specific, especially relating to uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, likely contact that these old world travelers had with sp specific groups. Once we start talking in gener generalities about uh, the Native Americans in contact with old world peoples is when we really begin to lose the argument. But when we get into the uh, specific groups or specific tribes and, and can and look at specific words or traditions, uh, uh, then we, we can maintain a, a semblance of, of, of credibility because there are well-documented cases of uh, Native Americans uh, having contact uh, and this documentation includes DNA evidence, it includes uh, uh, some of the, uh, the old world words finding their way into the Native American uh, language as well as uh, looks and other other traditions, uh, specifically uh, a, a group of Cherokees acknowledges that, uh, you know, they came from a Hebrew, Hebrew uh, tradition and they uh, celebrate uh, uh, some of the same holidays that, that Hebrews celebrate, including the Sukkot holiday. So, so within some of the Native American tribes, we do find specific evidence, but it would be a terrible mistake to suggest that the old world peoples uh, left a lot of artwork all over and that uh, there's a significant amount of it when in fact most of the petroglyphs are uh, uh, Native Americans or their ancestors. So uh, and it's the same with this kind of contact. We have to be very specific to tribes so we don't insult Native Americans. On the other hand, Native Americans uh, need to be open to uh, this new documentation and evidence and the concept that there was contact and there was exchange of information and perhaps uh, symbols, uh, language and ideas. A great example would be the symbol swastika, uh, which is uh, prevalent in many Native American uh, tribes in the Pueblo regions of the, of, of the West. Well, this is a Indus Valley symbol. It's a very ancient Indus Valley symbol and, it's, and uh, there's very little doubt that this symbol, as well as dozens and dozens of other symbols that made it to the Americas, made it uh, to North America and Central America, uh, came from uh, Asia or came from Indus Valley. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Davenport tablets? Well, you know, uh, I, did, I did have a uh, chapter in the book uh, and, and, uh, talking about the, the, the Midwest and there is a, a, a tradition of many artifacts that had uh, claimed to come out of the Midwest, specifically Michigan, uh, but, but also uh, other areas including Iowa. And I set upon uh, myself to go to the Midwest and, and talk to people, see some of the sites, and um, uh, the Davenport Stone is uh, a, one of these so-called relics it's in the uh, Davenport Iowa Museum and Dr. Fell uh, considered uh, this uh, Davenport tablet to be evidence of old world peoples and that the writing on it uh, to be uh, that of uh, 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 old world peoples and more recently other diffusionist scholars have have indicated that they agree but disagree on exactly if it's Egyptian or has other languages on it. Uh, what I discovered in uh, looking at the uh, Midwest is that there is uh, a, a era uh, called uh, the, the Great Age of Hoaxes. And this took place really between uh, around 1840 right up to the, the 19th century. There was just an incredible amount of forgeries, hoaxes, uh, and uh, 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 one group of relics called the Michigan relics that some diffusionists really use as evidence that uh, Egyptians had made it to America uh, because there are, there really are thousands of these relics. 
I found to be most of them to be hoaxes. And uh, it's, it's sad to say that such a significant uh, body of, of uh, so-called evidence, uh, thousands of tablets, uh, most of them, if not all of them, are hoaxes. But that is what I came to the conclusion. Now, the Davenport Stone that you ask about is, is not part of the Michigan relics. And while some diffusionist scholars claim that it uh, is proof of old world travelers, I went to Davenport, Iowa, talked to the uh, uh, museum curator. It's one of the few relics that is on display, and I think it is on display because it's been discredited. So uh, uh, while there are significant evidence of old world travelers in the way of artifacts, including coins, uh, many Roman coins, uh, as, as well as um, uh, other uh, physical artifacts, including rock art, I didn't find the Michigan relics or the Davenport stones and tablets to be convincing. Uh, in fact, uh, in case of the Michigan relics, as well as relics from uh, a source called the Burroughs Cave, which is also famous, uh, I, I believe most of, if not all, are hoaxes. And while I couldn't conclusively call the Davenport uh, stones now on display hoaxes, I didn't find it was convincing evidence. And that's why I didn't, uh, I spent one chapter on this, but it's why I focused uh, five chapters on the Celts. Because while they have been uh, in the golden age of hoax, many different hoaxes uh, and many different frauds perpetuated, throughout the Americas uh, documenting, you know, the, 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 the our history, there is plenty of evidence that is credible and suggestive. Most importantly, the inscriptions left by the Celts in a Celtic language accompanied by archaeoastronomy. So I really focused on what I consider to be the smoking gun cases proving that Columbus was not first, that he was last. And unfortunately, the Davenport Stone uh, and, and tablets, as well as the Michigan relics, are not smoking guns and, and in fact, uh, are likely hoaxes. Okay. Can you get into a little bit about the, uh, the sites you looked at in connection to Ireland and the Celts? Well, the Celts, uh, I think we could almost uh, rename New England as New Ireland. <laughs> uh, I believe that uh, the, the Celts really had a, a, a colony here. Uh, beginning perhaps uh, 2,500 uh, years ago and uh, uh, beginning with the uh, mining of copper in uh, uh, Michigan. But they, they really had their beachhead in New England, as indicated at America's Stonehenge in New Hampshire, as well as many sites in Vermont and, and uh, stone chambers in uh, uh, eastern, uh, excuse me, in western New York. They did mapping, we know that, from the Curins they left in uh, uh, Celtic rods uh, that has been documented. And uh, traveling the tributaries, they, they found their way to the Mississippi and from the Mississippi up the Arkansas. And from the Arkansas River, this is how they, they made their way into uh, Colorado, Oklahoma, and Kansas, probably looking for routes to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, in the uh, areas of uh, uh, Colorado, in particular, in Oklahoma, there's an abundance of inscriptions uh, at, I would, I would have to say, sacred sites uh, that uh, revolve around the equinox sunrise and revolve around the equinox sunset. And in some cases, uh, these cross-quarter days, Beltane is uh, uh, the, uh, the May Day holiday that uh, is still celebrated to this day, as, as well as Lunasa, who uh, uh, named after the, the Celtic sun god Lu. And uh, we find uh, uh, inscriptions to Lu and, and to Bel uh, and to Grian, these are Celt uh, Celtic sun gods, in Colorado and Oklahoma, accompanied by incredible uh, rock art and archaeoastronomy, I think that proves the Celts were here. And that's why I spent so much time on them. And, and not only do we have the physical evidence, but inscribed in the rock art and in the, uh, in, in the archaeoastronomy of, of the Celts is their cosmology. And I make the case in the book that some of the uh, wisdom of the Mithraic religion that was uh, uh, a very uh, much a, a part of, of the cosmology of the ancients 
uh, of, of Europe are found here in the New World, and most have been destroyed in Europe. So there's more information on the Mithraic religion in the Anubis Caves in Oklahoma than you can find throughout Europe, even though it originated in Europe. And this is the importance of really the new history, not only for Americans, but, but for, for, for the world. And why are the, the astronomical alignments uh, proof of connection to these people when couldn't the Native Americans have come up with the same alignments and marked them as well? And they did. But what, what, uh, what makes them proof and makes them unique is they're accompanied by, by Celtic inscriptions that you could read. In, in, and so, so that it's the uh, writing in the rock that couldn't have been faked in a Celtic language describing the astronomical event that occurs in the petroglyphs that are obviously not Native American petroglyphs. They are, they are old world petroglyphs. So the proof is with the uh, actual petroglyphs themselves, but most importantly with the accompanying Celtic inscriptions. And how does the, the mainstream view dismiss these things? Or do they just not look at them? They just don't look at them. Uh, a great example is that uh, you know one can go uh, uh, to the to the Four Corners area uh, in in the summer and see uh, dozens and dozens of of archaeologists and scores and scores of graduate students studying Anasazi sites at Chaco Canyon and 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 in the whole Four Corner areas, but. Uh, of these uh, uh, a dozen or so Celtic sites that you find, you will never see an archaeologist or a graduate student. They will stay away like fly. That, you know, they will not go to these sites or, or look at them, so they completely ignore them. And it's ironic that somebody would be uh, uh, so many people, so many archaeologists would be, you know, digging and looking at, at, at Chaco Canyon when, when not too far away they could be looking at a Celtic site and maybe making a profound discovery. But it's the fear that they would be associated with diffusionism, with Barry Fell, and with the new history of America that, that keeps them from, from looking at these sites. So, so in most of my experience, I rarely see archaeologists at these old world sites. All right, and we're going to stop there. We're going to do a second part to this because there's still a bunch of stuff I want to get to, um, and I don't I don't want to rush through it and just try to squeeze it in because uh, there's easily enough stuff here for another uh, another hour. Um, so the book is Secrets of Ancient America, Astro Archaeoastronomy, and the Legacy of the Phoenicians, Celts, and Other Forgotten Explorers. It's on Amazon. It's uh, it's out through Inner Traditions, and your site is what. Uh, www.newhistoryofamerica.com Okay, and do you, what, what can people find there as well? Well, they're going to see some information on the book, uh, in, information on me, a little about my history, some of the work that I'm now doing in renewable energy and industrial hemp. I talk a little about that on the site, uh, and those interested in learning about uh, the renewable energy and industrial hemp work that I'm doing can, can visit me at uh, purevisiontechnology.com. But I'd encourage people to go to uh, newhistoryofamerica.com if they want to purchase the book or find out a little more about it, I love to hear from the audience uh, with questions as well as uh, uh, information that they have. Some of the best kept secrets uh, are from uh, the radio listeners out there. So uh, please feel free to contact me uh, via my site, uh, newhistoryofamerica.com.